All right, I want to welcome Phil Strum to the Fight Game podcast. You may have heard Phil when if you listen to his interview with Dave Meltzer a few weeks ago on his podcast Under the Ring. Phil, what's going on? Not too much, Gary. Good to be here. Thank you for having me. So, explain uh quickly explain the the podcast uh your your idea behind the pod i mean you you get some really good guests and and i do want to sit here and talk about uh the podcast for a little bit but just explain how people could find it the network you're affiliated with and all that stuff sure it's done through the usa today network which is my employer but uh also it's available wherever you're going to get your podcasts so apple spotify google omni all that kind of good stuff and really, uh, the idea behind it, I, I've been wanting to do something for a long time. Uh, I had a blog previously with uh, with my uh, USA Today network. We it all kinda, did. It kind of faded out over time, but I, I did a lot of work <laughs> on it. So ultimately, Under the Ring kind of came back as a, you know what, what I think I'm good at is interviewing people. And the best part about pro wrestling is that there is no dearth of interesting people to have fun conversations with. So I basically just said, you know, I want this to be short form. It's going to be about 30 minutes or less. It's going to be a conversation with me and somebody in wrestling every week. I've had some good fortune to have some good, have some really, really good guests on so far. It's just getting started. I know the podcast space is crowded, but if you got a half an hour every week, it might be worth your time. Yeah, I just recently downloaded your feed when you told me that you had the episode with Dave on. And so since I've also heard the episode with Brian Gewertz, and I know you got some other stuff uh, coming out and you and you if, if you want to mention it, you can to get people excited. But um, who has been your favorite interview so far? That's a tough one. Uh, the one I just did yesterday that's coming out Monday was actually pretty good with Eddie Kingston. I really uh, I really enjoyed talking to him. Uh also, he's from Yonkers, so it was kind of interesting to just get get a New Yorker on with me. Uh, it just sounds terrible, probably for anybody who's outside <laughs> of New York, but whatever. Um, I really enjoyed doing the Dave interview. I really, you know, all of them have been so cool and unique. I, I think the one that was most fun to people outside of wrestling when I told them I did it was uh, Billy Corgan getting Billy Corgan mm -hmm. from Smashing Pumpkins in the NWA on uh, early on, and uh, I, I was kind of like as a you know, kid who grew up in the nineties. I'm like, the heck? I'm talking to Billy Corkin from the Smashing Pumpkins and he's sitting on the floor in his house talking into his iPad. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, we interviewed Eddie Kingston. It's, it's been over a year now, maybe even been longer than that. And unfortunately, yeah, actually it was, it would have been a little bit over a year because the Knicks were in the playoffs. They're playing mm -hmm. the Atlanta Hawks. And I didn't realize it, that we had scheduled the interview to happen during the game. And so as we're doing the interview, because I have the game, I, I would just have games on while I'm doing stuff in the background. So I the game was on when we were doing it for me. And I was like, oh, he's a giant Knicks fan. He's going to want to pay attention to the game. So he, he was professional, of course. I, I'm sure he had it in the corner of his eye, uh, as I did. But what I did for that interview is I would do, I would break in you know, we'd we'd ask him a question and go on for about 15 minutes and then I'd give an update on the score just to kind of let him know that I cared about this thing that I know that he deeply cared about as well. So that but he's he's a great God. What a, what a guy to, to talk to one. Not only the best interview or one of the best interviews, but also really, really good podcast guest. Absolutely. And I could probably talk about just old school wrestling with him. Same like, and this is an odd comparison, but like the two or three conversations I've ever had with Jim Cornette in my life, mm -hmm. like I had the same uh, kind of thought in my head, like, my goodness, I could I could go down a rabbit hole with this guy about old wrestling for like literally days if I needed to. Oh, 100 percent. Like, uh, you know, J Jim, uh, Jim has his, uh, you know, people who don't like him now who may have liked him in the past because of uh, his podcast today. But, you know. There's very few people in this world who I would rather talk about, you know, pre current wrestling than than Jim Cornette. Yeah, I remember the one time I, I he was up here. They did a he was doing his one man show at the time, uh, so they did one here in Poughkeepsie, and I actually didn't even go to the whole thing. I caught like the tail end of it after I went to another wrestling show actually. Um, but afterwards, we were just talking, and I was asking him about like you know when he first got into watching wwwf you know right when he was first getting tapes on that and what he thought of it how it compared to what, we, what he was watching in louisville and stuff like that and just 
I, I, I could just, uh, I, I love studying old wrestling uh, and just kind of learning from it. Uh, so and anything, anytime I get to do that and just kind of pick somebody's brain. I mean, Eddie Kingston, yeah. I ended up talking about all Japan because that's his thing, right. you know, and just, I don't know all Japan that well from an actual seeing it perspective. I've read about it, but I, I you know, I was asking him for recommendations. All right, what, <laughs> what should I watch? So, all right. So just, the, I, I wanted to ask you this, uh, I should have texted you, but under the ring, the idea of what's under the ring, is this an ode to like the guy who's got to hold on to the chair under the ring to give to somebody like, wh like what is the reason behind the, the title of the show? The way, the reason I initially named my blog that was just because some of the initial pitches for what I should do with my blog were kind of tongue in cheek and joke and people not really understanding what pro wrestling was or why it deserved media coverage and this and that. And I just, you know, they oh, should wear a mask in the photo promoting a blog. I'm like, no, no, this is not where I'm going with this. I'm going with this from the perspective of I have a news background and I would like to cover wrestling. So really under the ring was kind of just a, hey, we're going to kind of go underneath the surface. We're going to, you know, go dig, dig a little deeper. And maybe I didn't always do that at times, but that was that was the initial idea for the name of it and just trying to come up with something that was punchy and not necessarily used before. Being that you have a news background and, and a journal journalism background, what do you think about pro wrestling coverage? Now, obviously... Dave's been around forever. Wade Keller's been around forever. You have the newer folks like Sean Ross Sapp. Sean Ross Sapp, I don't know if he would even necessarily call himself a journalist, but I, I consider Sean Ross Sapp to be like master of new media kind of yeah. thing. Like he's been able to sort of figure out how to put their content everywhere that, that the eyeballs are. Uh, but then on, on the flip side, there's some really bad ones out there. I mean, right. the, the, there's, you know, no ethics whatsoever when it comes to this stuff. Uh, what is your take on on how pro wrestling is covered? I think what needs to come with pro wrestling news media consumption is an increase in people's media literacy in doing so. Um, of course, is Dave always 100 percent right? No, no one is <laughs> journalism ever. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, a lot of times, you know, you're going to get information that is stuff that ends up not happening. And by the nature of the way that Dave needs to do his job, he's going to get, you know, some weird tips sometimes, I'm sure. Um, anybody who's been a reporter gets weird tips sometimes. Um, but I, th I think that people need to separate. The one thing that drives me nuts is when I see people just throwing around the term dirt sheet without <laughs> even having a concept of what it means. There's copy paste sites out there that are oh, just yeah. garbage. And then there's like real actual journalism going on too. So it's like, you can't take Meltzer and Keller and sap and I'll, I'll give uh, John Pollock. John Pollock. Out yeah. He's, he's uh, outstanding for, John Pollock. for post wrestling. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, he's really good too. Uh, and I'm sure there's probably a few that I'm forgetting, unfortunately. Um, but you know, just, Learn what the difference is between that stuff. What's actually just a headline that you're clicking on? What's somebody that's actually going to dive into a topic? Who's somebody that's actually going to have people in these companies talking to them? You know, th think about that for a second when you when you're consuming news. Yeah. So and 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 kind of be able to weed out. There's so many bad faith kind of like actors both on social media and in in sort of the wrestling uh media landscape too i'm not going to bother giving them air because they don't deserve it but um just always look and consider the source of what you're looking at uh media literacy is something i'm really passionate about in general and i've spoken to like classes about it before yeah so um and i think that a, a lot of it can go a long way in the way that you consume your wrestling news. I mean, you made a great point in that when it comes to social media and when it comes to what Twitter can do, and now, you know, with Instagram, lots, lots of different memes, like you can send information out so quickly. And to some fans, all they're looking for is whatever it is to back up whatever point that they have. And so you just get this virality of stuff that is not probably not on the level probably not well researched could be just somebody lying just to 
it's full with Twitter. And so you see a lot of that stuff. And when it comes to what we try and do now, I, I will, I, I have a journalistic background, but I don't, I'm not a reporter, right? I, I, I'm a podcaster essentially. So I'm not even going to put myself in those shoes. But when I do these shows, I do use my experience to ask the right questions, yeah. to get the show going in the right direction, to what, because there's, you know, I have news like everybody else, but I'm not going to just blow through news and possibly offend somebody who, who may have given me that news. So like there's an ethics piece to this that yeah. uh, I think is very valuable to, to those who have it. And you can sort of tell, you can tell the folks who really know what they're doing in their shows, in their podcasts, because it's really outside of Dave, it's not very much a writing or report. Uh, it, it's still a reporting game, but it's not as much a writing game because Everything is so much online on Twitter, on Patreon, on YouTube, yep. you know, so, sort of just like this. So it, it's it's fascinating to me. And it, and it continues to change. It's changed a lot, you know, just as long as I've been consuming it, too. And really, the main reason I wanted to get Dave on my show, in addition to just being he's somebody I've looked up to for a very long time and also been an observer subscriber for a really long time, too, is that, and I didn't shut my email off, so let me close that before that goes crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, starting to get notifications. Um, it just, I wanted someone, you know, people would said like, oh, well, if you don't have somebody on from WWE and immediately ask them all the questions about Vince yeah. McMahon, you're terrible. Yeah. And I was like, well, the people that I'm having on my show from WWE are not going to be able to answer the question or have really the proper perspective of Vince's impact necessarily. Like if I've got Damian Priest on, what's he going to say about yeah. it? Yeah, he's he got nothing know, to say. He, he also doesn't know anything. Like he, he doesn't. He the wasn't same, there. Yeah. He's heard the same stories that that we've heard, right? right. So not... it doesn't do me any good. So what yeah. I wanted to do was, okay, Dave's the foremost, basically expert on Vince McMahon. He's covered him for forty years. You know, he covered the steroid trial. He's covered every step of the way that Vince was on. So who better to talk about? What's going to happen with Vince and what's going to happen with WWE than Dave Meltzer? Yeah. There's nobody. Yeah, absolutely. W one more thing, and I, and I wonder how, what you think about this, and then we'll move on. This is I, I didn't even intend for us to really That's talk fine. about wrestling media, <laughs> but it's something that is near and dear to both of our hearts. So it, yeah. I, I, I thought it was a nice intro, and it became a nice little discussion. So AEW uh, does, you know, does a few pay-per-views a year, and they're big events. And the way that Tony Khan uses I mean, even uses is the wrong word but um when it comes to media you have the 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 pre show call where people can call in and ask some questions and then he's got the scrum at the end of every show and i was pretty frustrated with one of those scrums now i was there i don't want any part of this stuff because it's like two hours uh, of you just hanging out in the back and and there's people streaming it like just it's it's chaos and and I get the people who like it they it's it's for their content channels right I get that piece of it that's not what I need it for so uh, I, I don't do it but the first question in one of the one of the the press conferences it was at the the Las Vegas show which was what's going on with MGF and Tony goes, no comment. I would have walked. I would have literally walked out because that's the only reason I'm there at, at that press conference is to get information and for him to no comment his wrestling storyline. Now he didn't have to tell me all the thing, but he should have had a prepared statement that gave the the people something. And so, what do you think about how he uses these pressers, which essentially to me, and I may be speaking out of turn here, but they're kind of like just how can I get the media to join in in my PR campaign after the show is over? Yeah, you hope it doesn't become that. I, I, I've been in a lot of um, I was a sports writer for 10 years, so I, I've been in tons of bad uh, media press conferences in my life. And <laughs> I might have even asked a bad question or two in sure. my day. Who knows? I don't know. I don't I don't really look into it that deeply. But uh, I think that uh, <clears throat> I think in that case, I would love to see that turn more into okay, if he's going to give a no comment, that the next person is going to pick up the ball. Yeah, yeah, bit, exactly. You know? and, and, and really just say, hey, look, Tony, we need 
at least somewhat of a statement on where things are at. Even, you know, you can give a no comment that's not a John Tortorella. I don't know if you're familiar with hockey, but no. you can give a no comment that's not a John Tortorella no comment where he just gives you one word answers for the whole press conference. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think those scrums, they are really long, first yeah. of all. I mean, I can't even I can could not believe how long some of them were. Uh, when I was at MLW several weeks ago, we, we had a post show one with Cork Bauer and he's like, we're not going to be here for two hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a big but, Cork guy. I know I know Cork rubs certain people the wrong way, yeah. but I love that guy. I think he's a, I think he's really good. I haven't had I haven't had really any issues at all. Um, but just I, I, I think that they invite a lot of media, both to the uh you know, that media call that they do going into the shows and, and at the show itself, I think that has pluses and minuses. I think you have some really legitimate media outlets in there. And then you have some that I, I actually don't even know what they are. And yeah. that's not, that's not a knock on them. Um, it's just, they're wide open to a lot of different voices. Some of which are going to be reporters who are going to be about holding companies accountable and some of which are going to be, I want to talk to AEW wrestlers, which is also fine, but it's just, it just creates such a, <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy. I've never seen anything like it. I like the accessibility though. Yeah. I think it's yeah. something, I think it's something we could see from WWE moving forward, especially considering the triple H was constantly doing those NXT, uh, pre-calls too, and, and utilizing wrestling media for some of that stuff too, which is also encouraging. Nice little transition there, because that's the next thing I want to talk to you about. But I, I just want to state, I don't fully blame Tony Khan for this. I also am holding the media accountable for what they are sort of allowing being created there. Because I think Dave, at least this is me talking to Dave, because I didn't watch any of that, any of that stuff. But I think he told me that he asked, and then he waited a little bit and then he asked again and he got the same answer. So then he stopped asking. I don't know who else may have asked, but that's, I, I didn't watch that one particularly either. So I'm just saying how I would, how I right. would have progressed sure. if I was sitting yeah, there. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. All right, let, let's move on. Triple H is uh, he's, he's been at the helm of creative now for a few weeks. And I, I asked this to, to Josh and Nason on uh, we're live pal the other day. And I think triple H has this very interesting uh, position in that he can make some creative changes now. He's not going to overhaul the entire thing. The thing works. But also at the same time, he has to make sure that the people who are watching still enjoy watching. Like you can't change it up so much that your current audience base is frustrated with the show. And so I started to wonder, do you think Triple H could actually grow a TV viewing audience that has been on decline ever since, you know, you, you and I were, were, were much younger people and, and wrestling was on fire and it was at its hottest. Now I think they've stabilized the ratings this year and they may have actually increased them a little bit year over year. And that's kudos to, to them for being able to do that because it's very hard to do. But do you think he could even take it to another level and maybe go get some fans who were attracted to AEW or who may have even stopped watching altogether because they were just frustrated with the product. I don't sense that that number is that movable. But when I started to think about it, I was like, huh, he's got to chase that, right? There's this yeah. giant sea of fans who used to watch wrestling that don't watch anymore. And I just wondered your thoughts on if he'd be able to get some of those folks back. I think he's got the opportunity to. I think that the audience is so... The audience that he doesn't have right now is so fragmented. Like you've got those lapsed fans, you know, the WCW fan, which is something I asked Eric Bischoff <laughs> about, you know, weeks ago. Um, and I, I talked about that with some of my friends before too. I think you've got the people who were big into the NXT black and gold who might have faded out when that changed. I think you I think the key to it though is because he's got that infrastructure so well built for him going in that he just needs to stick to the way that he wants to creatively tell stories and build stars. And if it's compelling enough content and if it's good enough stars, he's going to be able to build it anyway. I think the one advantage that he does have too, in terms of growing that audience is that WWE is never shy about using 
outside celebrities to increase the visibility. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, you know, but they, they don't like, you know, and I feel like triple H is going to be a little more maybe uh, straightforward about the way he's doing it maybe, but you know, you, you look at the way that bad bunny kind of moved the meter and the yeah. way that honestly Brock Lesnar was sort of an outside guy at one point, Yeah, uh, you know, to when, for when he came back off of his, uh, UFC run Logan Paul. Um, I think I, I thought the interview that he did with Triple H was pretty fascinating in, talk, in terms of them talking about ways that some of the things that Logan Paul has learned in digital marketing could yeah. help WWE down the road. So I think that as long as the stories are clear and easy to follow and interesting from week to week, I think you've got a shot because I think the way that he's going to approach wrestling is going to be a wrestling that people are a little more familiar with and a little more comfortable with. It's not going to be so regimented and it's not going to be so locked into a certain way of doing things. I think he's open to what a new ideas of what stars look like and are. And uh, I, you know, I, I don't know if it's going to grow any bigger than it is. It's, it's, it's kind of a societal thing too, I think with wrestling, but um, I, I think he's got a chance to get a really nice buzz. He's got to be pissed off at just at the timing of the whole scenario because he had the Undisputed Era just sort of waiting and waiting to come up and they would never come up. And this would have been the perfect time for them to come up as now there's no Vince to to Ixnay, you know, those guys coming up. So it's just the the, the timing for because AEW has a lot of the folks that he pushed in NXT right now. Yeah, but that's wrestling, though. Um, I've known wrestlers who are outstanding who just because of timing didn't catch on in certain companies. Uh, yeah. Okay. My tryout, if it would have been four weeks ago when X, Y, or Z was in charge, I probably would have gotten signed, but I didn't. So, but you know, and it's just, it's just the way the, the ball bounces and you got to go with who you got. I think what we're seeing right now, especially with WWE is that the quality depth of the roster was already present and people, sure. And people were just being used in ways that, Triple H is using them differently now. Can we grade the Triple H run or is it incomplete? Have you seen changes that you like? Yeah, I mean, I think from my own personal enjoyment of it, I think that Raw and SmackDown are all of a sudden much more watchable. Um, I really think that they've gone out of their way to make sure that there are multiple very good to great matches on all shows now. And I'll say when I was making decisions on buying tickets to Raw or SmackDown in the New York area, I was thinking to myself, eh, nothing's going to happen on this show. There's no reason I need to go to a TV taping. Like if if I'm going to go to a show, it's got to be something bigger than that. But now, you know, you look at them like, you know, Monday Night Raw from uh, from this, from the, you know, the August 15th uh, episode on Monday. And it's like, you know, there were three outstanding matches on that show, uh, all in different hours, probably to keep the audience you know, steady or as Mm -hmm. steady as they could keep it, which was probably the reason why Ziggler in theory closed the show because they weren't, they didn't want it at 10 o'clock and they didn't want it at nine o'clock. So where where else are you going to put it? Um, But I I, I thought McIntyre and uh, Owens was solid. And I thought Styles and Lashley was solid. And I think that just the way that they're formatting the show, it's a lot less cluttered. It's, you know, the segments are flowing. It's almost, and I mentioned this to Dave when we had our show is that, uh, it's a, it's a lot more flowing from segment to segment, sort of like the way ECW segments were sometimes mm-hmm. under Paul Heyman. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a good thing. It keeps, you know, <laughs> you're, you're competing for people's attention spans yeah. with those shows. Yeah. And if you can hold them for more than one segment, you, you probably picked up a win. All right, I, I don't think you can grade it though yet. I, yeah. I think it's, it's going to be incomplete. Such, it's such a gradual build. Maybe in a year we can see exactly, okay, where did he get? in that year, what was mania, you know, what was the big moment of mania, you know, I'm sure he's going to have some, uh, some pitfalls along the way too. Um, yeah, absolutely. because naturally people are going to get injured. People are going to not exactly perform the way you want them to, but that's, that's wrestling too. All right. What about NXT? Now I, th- this actual podcast, me and my partner, John LaRocca, the goal of the podcast was when they were going head to head. And even when they stopped going head to head, was we we sort of did a, a show. Okay, what was good about NXT? What was good about Dynamite? What was not good about NXT? What was not good about Dynamite? And we do both shows. 
And, you know, a few months ago, NXT just became unwatchable. We were not looking forward to doing that. So we just sort of extended our Dynamite review. And the, the show is mostly about Dynamite now. But if NXT does get better and Triple H has a little bit more fingerprints on that show, and it, it doesn't have to go back to the black and gold, but if right. it sort of looks a little bit more like that or a hybrid of what we have, I know there was a big NXT UK influence uh, on it recently. But what do you think about NXT? Do you what are what are your uh, thoughts about where that show may go in the future? I had a big problem with it when they made the switch, mostly because I could not really tell what the direction actually was. I could tell that they wanted it to be developmental, but I really didn't see kind of the the long term vision of it. Um, and I think the other complication they had was they were debuting about 35 people at the same time. <laughs> and that's hard to do in general. Yeah. Um, it had improved, I thought, over time um, to the point of last night. Last night, I thought it was solid. Uh, the, you know, the, the episode, uh, the Heat Wave show that they did. Um, I thought there were some really good matches on there. And I think that they're going to get to a point where it's going to be kind of what it was at the beginning of Black and Gold, which mm. was – or. The, what people would remember as the kind of the golden era, right, right, gold, right. for lack of a better term. We're, we're, we're takeovers with the best wrestling yeah. shows in the U.S. Because I think they're committed to getting the high level athletes and you should because that needs to be a part of your recruiting process because it's a tried and true thing throughout the history of wrestling that high level athletes do become stars at times. And they're also, I think, going to weave those in maybe with some veterans that they aren't maybe using on Raw or SmackDown or perhaps, you know, some people from the past that they want to bring in to work with those folks. Because the only way you get better in wrestling, as far as I know, is by working with people who are better than you. So I think we could see some fun stuff with, you know, you take a guy like maybe like a Drew Gulak who they aren't using really right now on SmackDown. But you mix him up in the ring with somebody like Grayson Waller or um, uh, Cal Bloom, which is, I forgot what his NXT name is, Von Wagner. Yeah, Von Wagner. Um, you know, you, you put Drew Gulak in there with them, and they're going to get better, and Gulak can perform, and he's going to rise the level that, they, that they're performing at. So I think you're only going to see stuff grow with them because I feel like the path to the main roster is going to be a lot easier now. It's not going to be you – work in NXT and then you get a push for two weeks on raw and then they give up on you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you had a question for Dave that I'm not sure you even really got to, <laughs> you got to fully ask him, but you were, you were sort of comparing NXT and ROH. And I was kind of wondering where you were getting at with that. Where I was going with that is just because, you know, really what NXT was, was born out of going after, what ROH was grabbing at that time, which was stuff with the Young Bucks and 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 Hangman and all those guys, and they were really doing some great business um, in the U.S., especially in a little bit, you know, crossed over to New Japan and and stuff like that too. And NXT was really born out of going after that style, I guess, of performer. So they were really going after the same piece of the pie. And my question to Dave as I see NXT possibly changing in the next few weeks of kind of maybe more of what Triple H is shooting for, and I see ROH kind of rising up and sort of becoming an AEW satellite company of sort of developmental but not, I was kind of thinking that NXT and ROH again might be going after the exact same piece of the pie depending on you know, if ROH gets it, obviously ROH needs a deal. That's that's the dependent part that you need right. to happen for them to really become a player. But if that happens and NXT moves ahead with Triple H going after some of the same people, I feel like we're right back where we were, but in a very different way. You know, that that's that's interesting. I'm trying to think of who would be, who's on the current ROH roster, or at least has been uh, on their pay per views who triple h would go after you think um well i know him so i'm gonna <laughs> push him but i think bill carr is somebody who would fit very well in nxt or wwe and he's been in their system before um and his group with the righteous is something that's worked very well they were on the i think the uh the pre-show for uh 
for ROH when mm -hmm. uh, when they had their last pay per view. I, I could see him being somebody. I I don't believe that Willow Nightingale is under a contract mm -hmm. to anybody right now. That's a good I, one. I could see her being somebody who could. Uh, I, I would sign her if I were WWE. I mean, I don't know. That's the problem too. I don't know what anybody's real contractual <laughs> situation is right now with R the ROH stuff, because I feel like as soon as we find out that somebody is with ROH, they just kind of tell us like, Oh, the Briscoes yeah. are here. Oh, by the I way, know. Blake Christian, we've got him too. Like, I know. so it's, it's hard to say, but I, I think that a lot of the people at the end of ROH and kind of that sort of level of independent wrestler, they're up for grabs, right? Yeah. Now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and who knows who Tony actually has on deals, actual salaries versus the, you know, some of the weekly deals. Cause I would imagine, right. You know, the guys who are not under salary are what, like you said, up for grabs if WWE does want to attempt to sign them. So, uh, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> well, I was, I was just going to end it and give you another opportunity to kind of talk about your upcoming show with Kingston and, and all that stuff. And, and we'll get out of here. Yeah. So it, it, you know, it's under the ring pro wrestling conversations. It drops every uh, Monday about 5 AM or so uh, where, where you get podcasts. Um, it's, we try to have somebody uh, interesting for, for people to listen to each week. Uh, I think we've done a pretty good job so far in uh, delivering that we've got uh, Eddie Kingston coming up on uh, Monday. Some other possible ones coming up that I can't say yet. Uh, Larry Dallas, who I believe we might both know, is yeah. going to be on in the coming weeks. We were jo I was joking with him on Twitter was that uh, I had him as kind of an evergreen for, you know, popping in for when I didn't have an episode one week. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you've become the Veer Mahan of my podcast. You're just waiting and waiting and waiting for the Larry Dallas edition. But you now Larry's got some good perspective and I really hadn't talked to anybody about triple a uh, Lucha Libre yet. So that was, that was good to get with him. Uh, too. Yeah. I, I like Larry a lot. He, he gets some heat on, he's a heat machine he sometimes, but I he really creates like it for himself sometimes. Yeah. Too, oh, a hundred percent. Um, I will, I will give a recommendation to go and download the last episode with Brian Gewertz, whose book just came out. I thought that was very cool. He was really thoughtful in, in some of his answers that he gave you. Uh, and, you know, he's he's this is what he's doing now. He's going on shows and he's promoting the book. But you're not, you know, I'm, I'm sure he's doing multiple podcasts. And yet he still was giving you like really, really thoughtful answers. So I really like that. Yeah, I was really looking forward to that one, uh, and I thought it came out really well. I, I think what I can probably bring to the table with my show is I, I'm really just trying to craft an interesting conversation with the person. The best, the best interviews I've heard are are, are largely just really good improv. Um, and the best part of interviewing somebody is being able to listen to the answer and also adjust your question. Not just, I do walk in with a ton of notes cause I over prepare for everything. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And I sometimes have prepared questions too. Um, but it, it's really just like, you know, it, if I can get to a point with somebody where I'm just having a conversation with them, that's, that's, it's probably the best and it's probably the best for the listener too. Yeah. hundred percent. All right. Thanks to Phil Strum for joining us here. Uh, so thanks to Phil. Thanks to everybody listening. Uh, I'm Double G. See you when we see you. Peace out.